Most people, as you know, get very little money. We work in museums. Most of them work in museums because we love it. You know, we're like with altruistic cultural workers. And I think when we critique them, we can critique like museum institution, but I think we should be a bit more realistic and actually acknowledge how wonderful they are. Don't you think? <laughs> But it's not me who started the debate about the changes, you know. <laughs> no, you start. You start. You you were like you were like really you were really putting fire into the into the you know into the <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but at least at least uh, that's what you know. I I told you I've been uh, you know a few days listening also part of this conference which was organized by Museum of Moscow, where first of all I learned that uh, city museums are much mm -hmm. more cool, kind of more intellectual, and much more digitally kind of sophisticated than art museums of course mm -hmm. and you know and we, we, it was the most intellectually interesting conference i attended this year right not put by university not put by art museum but put by city museum so you know there is also maybe it's also if you look outside of art museum you know it it can be you know, film museums and all kinds of stuff anyway city um, museum, do you mean I, museum of moscow this conference yeah no. museum, it was it was a it was a great event it was absolutely great i mean i'm now listening to all the sessions i missed yeah it was really great this one we had mm -hmm. last week, well, it was like a big one, big one. It was also very diverse, you know, we had a, well, I mean, we had a curate, and we had mm -hmm. museum people, we had sociologists, we had anthropologists, we have urbanists, we had architects, but, you know, we do it every year, right? So I think it's, uh, you know, uh, I'm not trying to compare your, which was like, you know, very real, you know, almost organized in real time, but I'm just saying, you know, I was very impressed with what these people put up. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, art, art museums, I mean, you know, they sit, this artworks cost so much money, right? And we're so connected to oligarch, you know? So like, you know, what mm. do you expect them to do? You know, what, I mean, how, how, what, do, what can we expect them to do, you know? Yeah, true, true. Anyway, anyway, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so do, do okay. you think uh, we, we, uh-huh. Oh, sorry, one, just quick question. How, how long we skip for? Um, if you can do it in like for 20 minutes, because now we have yeah. like four presenters for this sure 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 panel. yeah yes. so shall we wait for a minute to um give an opportunity sure sure very very important for discussion yeah and benjamin uh hi nice to meet you i so much enjoy uh, your i'm so unfortunately you know like it's kind of i'm getting sore and it's kind of cold so i just fell asleep in the afternoon <laughs> so i only woke <laughs> up towards the end of a session i'm so sorry but i will watch it in video but very much enjoyed your kind of like you know nice emotional comments and uh, I'm the thing about, yeah 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 and i'm like i'm now i'm now going to be going defending museums that's my new thing you, know, so you, you guys everybody attacks it i will go defend it so it's my thing <laughs> um, but you know i'm not attacking i'm slowly destroying them from inside <laughs> Joking, joking. I love museums, especially people. No, no, no. We, 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 you know, we love them, and that's why we can, like, you know, it's a family. We love them, and that's why we can be, you know, critical. But, um, but um, anyway. Well, okay, great. I think it's um, three thirty already. Yes. Um. Yeah, and um. So we can open um, our next. Um, panel, our second panel, and they're, they're going to be four speakers, and we start with um, Lev Manovich, and then um, it's Valery Lidinov who is present here physically in Istanbul, then it's Angelina Lucenta, I can see you, Angelina too, and then the concluding talk is uh, uh, by Panas Kambatiaris, um, who is also here. All right, all set. And then, um, yeah, let me just uh, give a warm welcome to our first presenter, uh, Lev Manovich, uh, and his talk is called How to Predict um, Future Culture. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And uh, also, you know, many, you know, uh, congratulations, welcome, thank you for the participants, uh, from what I understand from Margarita, this, this was like really kind of, you know, a blitz, like a blitz organization, like really everything came together in a few days, so very, very impressive. And, uh, uh, you know, it's the end of this very interesting year, so lots of things to discuss. So before I start, um, I still want to apologize, but actually, I would love to talk about what happened this year and my experience with museums, but I hope we'll have time to discussion. 
but I think my talk is going to be you know, a bit different. Um, uh, and it's really thinking about uh, the kind of future of culture, you know, beyond next year and the year after next year, and thinking about uh, the idea, uh, which is the following. So museums and humanities, right, academic humanities, you know, film studies, literary studies, and history, architecture, history, and so on, are absolutely essential right, in educating people about human history, human culture, the diversity of human intellect and artistic imagination. And we also have people in humanities who deal with present, right? You know, film critics, art critics, you know, digital art critics, people who write about things like Max Rembrandt, uh, people who write uh, texts you know, for museum exhibitions. But one thing which um, humanities, I mean, like humanities not in terms of artists or filmmakers, but humanities more in terms of people who talk and write, which is like most of us here, we haven't been doing at all, is systematically thinking about the future. Uh, so, in the last 10 years, especially in the States, where the number of uh, undergraduate students enrolling in humanities courses has dropped between 30 and 50 percent. And humanities are in crisis, you know, and people keep trying to wonder, like, what to do. And maybe it's not as bad in other places. Um, I think one thing which humanities can do, uh, or which I would like them to do, to have a more uh, interesting presence and a more kind of important presence in contemporary debates is to become a bit futurist and start kind of systematically, even scientifically, thinking about how to predict the future of culture. Uh, so I had this idea for a few years uh, and was looking for like an opportunity to try it out. And then I was invited uh, this fall to teach uh, a short course, you know, we call them models. So it's actually was eight weeks, eight sessions, uh, teaching 60 undergraduate students in humanities at the best Russian university, uh, which is Moscow School of Economics. Uh, so Margarita is a professor, right, at that school in the St. Petersburg division. And I was teaching over Moscow division. So as I started to develop a kind of website for a course, it allowed me to sketch you know, some of this idea's fervor. So I will share my screen and kind of take you through uh, some of the content which I started to develop around this idea. How serious I'm about, I'm, how serious I'm about this idea? Would I simply write a book? Would I spend the next 15 years developing it as a new field or a new paradigm? I'm not sure, but probably it is the book because I do feel that this is really idea worth developing. And I hope, uh, you'll see also why in the next 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Uh, by the way, you know, the course is developed in Milanote, which is a best software used by designers, architects, other creatives for collaborations, and we also use it in design field to teach classes. Okay. So, zoom in. Okay. So science fiction movies and novels, uh, global economic organizations, right? UNESCO, World Bank, and so on. Right? Uh, national right? NGOs, various think tanks, you know, places like Rand Corporation, right? and many others make predictions about the future. It's very business. But these predictions seem to only concern social and economic aspects of human life. Technology, space travel, the impact of climate change. Now people think about the impact of future pandemics, right? Countries' economies, population growth. Sorry for the typos, just noticing them today, and so on. But what we're never told is what kind of culture we may have decades from now. Fashion, literature, cinema, social media, visual art, theater performance, I mean, video games, images, photography. All our cultural forms and formats are completely absent from its predictions. Yes, of course, if you look, for example, at fashion industry, you know, very, very intensely thinking about what will happen to fashion, uh, you know, high fashion, uh, fast fashion. Uh, but usually, you know, we're thinking maybe, you know, two, three, five years ahead, right? So if you actually know about trend hunting, 
and trend predictions. It's a whole industry, right? We're a wonderful companies which do it, but you know, they predict like usually like six months ahead and only work on long-term, but long-term for them is two years. Okay. Sometimes you will see some conference which we called something 2025, but not 30 years. Yeah. So I don't really care you know, about year 2050, but this number, which is 30 years away, is simply to indicate that maybe it's about time we have my just join uh, our kind of fields or our agents in our society and start thinking about the future of culture in a kind of systematic way and try to think about what, what methodologies, both quantitative and qualitative, we can use. So the idea of my course, so the students presented a few of their projects last week, and I'll see more next week. Uh, the idea was to learn how to use humanities theories and histories to predict particular cultural forms, themes, and aesthetics in the coming decades of the 21st century. Uh, so, uh, you know, this was the first time I taught the class. You know, I'm not sure it fully worked out, but I will continue. I will teach it again in other places. I will write about it. So for myself, I started to think about uh, what kind of theories we can take from humanities, which are theories of cultural change and cultural innovation. And then we can use these theories to try to you know, think about systematically the future of culture in coming decades. So here would be just a few examples, right? It would be, for example, Viktor Shklovsky, Art of the Device, 1917. His idea that through everyday life, uh, people's perception becomes kind of dull. We don't notice things around them. Even artists have to come in and refresh our perceptions. And that happens perhaps in you know, every generation because the avant-garde artistic form after a while become also predictable and also we don't notice them anymore. So this is a wonderful modernist theory which suggests that the kind of cultural uh, innovation, right? And that the updating of perception, updating of cultural languages will continue to happen. Well, of course, we have something Margarita knows very well, right? And uses brilliantly in her work, Pierre Bourdieu distinction, a social critique of judgment of taste, right? Very influential work in sociology of culture based on the surveys of French public in the 1960s. Uh, which suggested that there is a kind of strong relation between the kind of social economic class and cultural taste. Uh, since that, since that time, right, many sociologists of culture have tried to both disprove and prove this theory. I think there are definitely many signs that today sometimes these connections are weaker, right? So if some you know, if you encounter somebody who wears jeans and sneakers, that can be, you know, Uber driver or it can be a millionaire, right? It's kind of hard to say. Uh, so what will happen further to this kind of distinction and the kind of high-low dimension in the coming decades? Uh, we can also think about Marshall McLuhan understanding media, right, and other kind of very grand theory of cultural change from, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, right, whether it's correct or not, but besides the matter, the point is that we had theorists in humanities you know, who gave us very interesting ideas of cultural change, right? So in the case of McLuhan, we have a kind of dichotomy between the typographic uh, consciousness, right, and this kind of mosaic uh, TV consciousness. You know, and then, of course, we have lots of more recent work, for example, John Zelinsky on human photography, which is about you know, uh, satellite images, computer images, all kind of imaging, which is done not by, not by humans and not for humans. So another way, I think, to approach this idea is to think about theories proposed by some important artists, designers, architects, and filmmakers, and use these theories to justify your future vision, right? And here I'm thinking in particular about our such as futurism, suprematism, and constructivism, and why these movements are so relevant, because we participants were theorizing imagining and in some cases building creating buildings urban area movement is that um, we literally wanted to create art of a future for a future society so often it was associated right with a kind of new idea of communist society so the idea of the society should have fundamentally new type of visual plastic material language and uh, and so in a way, these people act as a kind of futurists, right? Both as a, somebody, people who predict the future, but then, right? um, 
So let me show you some more. Um, so this were, for example, the kind of lectures you know, I gave to the student. Um, so we talked about, for example, some of the relevant fields. Uh, see time, and on the y-axis you have average shot length, right? So films which have a quick editing, with average shot length would be shorter, and films which are slow, right? The average shot would be longer. So on one extreme, you would have somebody like the Gewertov, on the other extreme, you'd have somebody like Tarkovsky. You know, and what you see is that if you kind of fit, right? If you fit, you know, if you apply linear regression to this data, you can see that there is a very gradual, very systematic pattern, right? So films, you know, they're getting quicker and quicker. So again, you can potentially, right, project this into the future and at least hypothetically predict uh, some aspects of film language in the coming decades. Uh, and then um, just maybe one more thing. Uh, actually, let me show you this one. Let me show you this one. And then to be the last thing I show. Um, so digital humanities had particularly lots of successes in literary studies because there's just like more people kind of working on it. And um, this is my sort of favorite digital humanist in the US, Ted Underwood and his collaborators. So they um, published this paper a couple of years ago where uh, what we do is we kind of look at the transformation of how gender has been represented in the data set of over 100,000 uh, English language novels from 18th century until today. So let me open this paper, just downloaded this. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So there's lots of interesting you know, things in this paper. So obviously, you know, I want to finish in two minutes, so there's time for discussion. Uh, but for example, you know, it just kind of gives you examples of the kind of things you can do once you have big cultural data. So for example, you can look at, uh, you know, what proportion, what proportion of, like, propor not just proportion of women characters, but proportion of the size, the size of text devoted to the description, right, of women characters. And you can see how it's not a linear change, right, but it's a kind of very systematic kind of wave-like change, right? So it goes down till about, I guess, I guess in the, you know, Anglo-Saxon world, the 1960s was the most masculine period, and then it starts going up. So that's one thing you can do. Of course, you can also look at fraction of books written by women. Uh, here you also have very interesting patterns, right? But then you can do kind of more, uh, sort of even more subtle things. Uh, let me just see, just see here. Okay, just a second. Uh, so here we're using machine learning, right? Which is a kind of basic technique in artificial intelligence and data science to try to, um, get computer to predict if particular description of a character is if a description you know, is a is a man or a woman and why this is interesting right if um, you know if uh, if uh, if a novels use a modest in language right for example to describe female characters versus male characters the computer will be able to predict it much better but if uh, the distinction in language right is not so clear the computer will not be able to predict it. And that gives us interesting ideas about the representation of gender in, uh, in novels. And here we have, you know, 200, right, 200 years. And we can see how, in fact, the accuracy of prediction, right, systematically goes down. So it means that uh, in that particular dimension, right, the gender was defined kind of more sharply uh, 200 years ago than today. So the article is a wonderful catalog of like you know various various ways in which uh, in which you know we can track representation uh, performance of gender literature and this is the last thing right this is also super interesting in terms of thinking about how for example cultural language will change in the future so what we also found out is that you can look at thousands of different words in word frequency also changes very systematically right so here for example we could see that the word God right. Uh, is was a bit more associated with males during this period, but now, but when more recently, right, it's uh, it's it's gender specificity become less specific, right, less specific. And then we also, for example, see like a word read, right, uh, and then also we see a word felt, right, which was again in some periods associated more strongly with female versus male characters. So I can go on and on, but I want to stop here. 
Um, so I think that this is an interesting project uh, because it, um, first of all, it allows us, right, to put together things like digital humanities and uh, theories from you know, previous centuries of humanistic thought, history, you know, uh, history of science and so on. And then things like future studies and futurism, uh, future prediction and data science uh, and also avant-garde art. And also potentially uh, it can be interesting kind of exercise which perhaps uh, may create a kind of new space for humanities, not only being kind of bastions and uh, defenders and promoters of the past, but also people who can kind of play, uh, sit at the same table of economists, social scientists, uh, and so on, uh, and futurists, and think about the future of culture, and not only future of culture in terms of, for example, what's going to be the role of professionals versus amateurs, what will happen to democratization of design trend, right? What will happen to fashion? What will happen to the kind of high low distinction? But also what will happen to, you know, visual design? What kind of images, you know, we'll see in, in coming decades? What will happen to visual language? You know, what's it maybe the role of 3D versus 2D, photo versus video and so on and so forth, right? Um, so um, I've only been involved in this journey for a few weeks. I will continue, I think for a number of years. If you're interested, you drop me an email. Let's do it together. And thank you so much for listening.